Good. <laughs> so we're back with our live. Today we're talking about Yay. kings and emperors. Kings and emperors. Well, last, the last two weeks ago, we did princesses. Queens. Right? Queens, Queens and empresses. Queens and empresses. So we're, we're showing the men a little bit of love this time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That was fair. Did we have people asking about the men? Well, I really wanted to do the Napoleon and because he was uh, coronated on December 2nd, 1804 uh -huh. and about that whole painting thing. But I asked everybody, a lot of people wanted kings and emperors. So. so we're not, we're talking about all the kings and emperors, not just Napoleon. Hey, Tina, yeah. thanks for joining yeah. us. I got the Napoleon questions in there though. Of course, Napoleon's included. Cheryl, mm -hmm. thank you for coming. Hey, Cheryl. Hi, Tina. Thanks to everyone who's making it to hang out with us. We're going to talk about kings and emperors tonight, and it's going to be trivia. So we always want to hear from you guys. We want you to interact with us and give us some answers to the questions. We always enjoy hearing from you. Cheryl's always Cheryl always knows the answers. Cheryl's very smart. She's very smart. Like our followers are pretty intelligent. They know their French history. Hey, Carrie. Hi, so Carrie. Here. We like to hear from everybody, new and old. If you're shy, don't be shy. Just throw in a guess. I don't know any of the answers. <laughs> you can be you like a Roman numeral lesson just before we started. <laughs> we seriously had a Roman numeral lesson. She just taught me something I never knew before. And yes, Claudine is my history teacher. I went to <laughs> So <laughs> it didn't work out so well for me. <laughs> France is my my history uh, my history school. Yes, Tina's here for the history. Me too. I'm here to learn. I want to I want to learn with Claudine. So we're gonna throw them out. But Claudine, can you give out like some of maybe the people we're gonna talk about, or they just have to completely guess? Mm, I kind of tried to keep it more the latter side of kings. Um, there are some early, but I didn't go like super early, early, you know, mm -hmm. um, that would be, that might be a little bit of an, a big stretch, but I think some of them, some of the questions, uh, I think people should be able to get them. Some of them I made, uh, I try to make them a mix of kind of medium, mm -hmm. medium, medium strength on the trivia, but yeah. And I always, this always gives me a chance to talk about some of my favorite ones. So some of my favorite ones are Henry the Fourth, Francois Premier, and Louis the Louis the three, especially the last three Louis. All right, guys. So there's some clues about who you might want to guess about. Jennifer, <laughs> sunny Florida, jealous. I haven't seen the sun in quite some time. Giuseppe's talking to Coco in the background. Let's get started. So our first question. Which king became a saint? So we're talking about kings and emperors. If you're just tuning in, throw out some answers, guys. So how well do you remember French history? Cheryl was a junior in high school, and one of her texts was used in French, her French third class. Her third French class? French the third. Nice. French three. So, yeah, she's already hooked. I'm hooked once I got to Paris. I was like, wow, there's so much fascinating history, so much to learn. So... I didn't really get involved until I got here. Because when you're in it, it's so much more interesting too, right? When you're walking Especially around. Especially when you walk around and see it. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. like walking around a, a live history lesson. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any idea which king became a saint? Cheryl's got an answer for us. And he's the only one that became a saint. The only one who became a saint. Yes. I feel like they all wanted to saint themselves, though. They oh, yeah, I think they definitely. God. Especially a few of them. Oh, Cheryl's from St. Louis. St. Louis. Oh, this is why Cheryl knows this. <laughs> I like Carrie's answer. There we go. <laughs> Carolyn, that's my sister's name. That's a great name. All right, we have some smart people here. Is it true that Saint Chapelle was built for him, Claudine? It is. Well, he had it built. I could, I, could, I could tell you that. I could tell you that one. Louis, it was Louis the Ninth. 
he um, he died in 1270. He ruled for 44 years and he was actually canonized really quickly, um, just 20, 27 years after he died, which was very quick back then. Now it's a little bit different. Like when they talked about Mother Teresa and make canonizing her, it's quite the long process. But he was raised by Blanche de Castille, who was very religious and relate, um, raised him to be very religious. He, um, Louis, what he's best known for is because he is the one that bought the crown of thorns and a few of the other relics of Christ. He brought those back uh, to Paris and had Saint-Chapelle built. Saint-Chapelle cost about a third of the cost to build it that he, than he spent on the actual relics himself. Wow, the relics were expensive. They're very, very expensive. And if you've ever been into Saint Chapelle, you, I mean, it's called the jewel box for a reason. Because when you go up to the a second, up to the upper floor, it's basically just the walls are all stained glass. It's absolutely gorgeous in there. Mm -hmm. So he actually had that built to for the uh, for the relics, which remain there for quite a long time until they eventually are Notre Dame. Well, not right at the moment, but. Yeah, I was curious where, because when I visited, there weren't so many relics. I was like, where'd the relics go? So they you were... have to go into the treasury at Notre Dame. Mm, the treasury. You ever go to the treasury? I've never went to the treasury. You have to pay. Yeah, it's uh, it's really fascinating. But there was quite a few of them in there, and they um, they actually have most of like the the crown of thorns only comes out once a month, and then it's locked away very uh, very carefully. And some of the other things there was this uh, the tunic he was wearing, Saint Louis was wearing when he actually got the relics, and then there's a piece of the true cross is what is I think I think those are the ones that are remaining. I didn't know they actually had so much like. Jesus relics. It's supposed to be actually the crown of thorns that was on Jesus' head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know that I would have paid the five euros to go see well, it. You can't see it in there. You, it's it's not on display. It's like once a month on display. Once a month. It's I, I believe it's the first Friday of the month. I think it is. And then every Friday um, between Lent, but from the start of Lent to Easter. Interesting. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, when Notre Dame is finished, you know where to see. The crown of thorns. It's actually, they had it as Saint Jean, so they a processional with they did this at a different. Church. So you can still I, see it. I would assume they're moving it around with Notre Dame being closed for so long. Yeah. All right, guys. Good answers. We are a smart bunch. So next question. He believed Paris was worth a mass. So which king or ep emperor believed that Paris was worth a mass? I learned about this on one of my Paris walks, one of my tours around Paris. I believe there's another like famous statue of him on a horse next to the Seine, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many men on horses in this, this city. Heidi's asking why did they move all the relics from Saint-Chapelle? The revolution. Mm. The revolution uh, revolutionaries were going around and basically wanting to destroy anything that was in regards to any of the monarchy and a lot of things with the um, with the church. And so they were taken out of there at that time and hidden away. Mm, and they just didn't put them back. Yeah, they waited to tell uh, Napoleon actually was the one who gave them to Notre Dame thinking, you know, it was Napoleon and he was doing a grand gesture. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, Carolyn accidentally got to see the crown of thorns. That's cool. <laughs> it's, in like a, it's in like a container. So it's not like it's just the, you know, crown outside sitting there. It's like in a, like a, a plastic or glass, glass container type. Thing. Yeah, probably some kind of like airtight situation. Yeah. All right, guys, we got some good guesses. The correct answer is Henry the Fourth. He was, and again, another one of my favorite. Um, he was actually raised Protestant, and when he um, was getting married, and we did actually mention this, I think, in the one two weeks ago, we talked about the queens. He was going to marry um, Margaret de Valois, and it was Catherine de Medici's daughter, who Catherine made a, a stipulation that the only reason they could get married is if they have, um, if he, they would never try to change her their her daughter into a protestant well later on he actually ended up changing into um a, he took over catholicism and so he had said paris was worth a mass and of his indoctrinated 
I am now Catholic. I like it. it Paris is worth a mass. That's like his yeah. famous words. And then he like, yeah, he had a terrible ending if I remember my history tour correctly. Yeah, he was stabbed. Yeah, some crazy guy came out and mm -hmm. stabbed him. I think we I think we we have something around that later on in the questions. All right, guys, keep that in mind. <laughs> Here's next question. This king installed a library into the Palais de Louvre. So which one of these kings do you think had a library put into the Louvre, the Palais de Louvre? This is this is one that goes way back. This is a this is a way back. So it was the Palais de Louvre. So you have to think that was a very long time ago. Because it was actually still a palace that people were living in. 14th century. I think 14th century. Who had a library put into the Palais de Louvre? I definitely would not know this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We have a pretty smart bunch though. They might know this. It was hard to hey, Phyllis. It was hard for me to not to make these questions all about the kings in the Louvre. <laughs> <laughs> Your obsession. Yeah, it definitely is. So does, if you're just tuning in, we're wondering who had, which king had a library installed into the Louvre? Does anybody know the answer? Palais. The Palais de Louvre. That should give you a clue right there. Mm -hmm. Just throw out some names, you know, any names that sound kind of French, Pierre, <laughs> Henry. There's Henry's, there's Louis, there's Charlie's, there's. <laughs> I mean, I think that's a great guess, Carrie. It's a very French king name. Francois Prim. Known some Francois in this country. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a guess about who had a library installed into the Palais de Louvre? I think that's not a bad, bad guess. It was actually Charles V. Yes, it was Charles V. Uh, he reigned. Um, he reigned over France from 1364 to 1380, and he um, had the Palais de Louvre modernized. So this is 14th century modernization. Um, but he was known as um, Charles the Wise, and he read a lot. And so he actually took the Falconry Tower and had it changed into a library. So today you can still see part of it because it's part of the, in the basement of the Louvre, if you go down there where they actually uncovered the old um, towers and parts of the wall, there's part of it where the outside of the tower that was his library it has where the step, and so you can still actually see it today. Mm. Those books went into um, National now. So there was over, he had almost a thousand books there and some of them are still saved today. Oh, wow. That's crazy. How cool would it be to see that library? Yeah. I don't think they're out like, you know, people could just thumb through them. I'm sure if they're from the 14th <laughs> century. <laughs> Check this one out. Yeah. That's very cool. All right, guys. Next question. He was named king at only nine years old, but he wouldn't reign over France until he was 17 years old. So which one of our kings was crowned at nine years old, but then he wasn't allowed to be in charge till 17, which still seems very young to me to be in charge of a country. <laughs> like, I wouldn't think of any 17 year old that'd be very good at that. No, and normally the uh, the actual age was 13. So they could actually reign at 13. So why'd they make him wait till he was 17? Well, that's part of the story. It wasn't him, it was his mother. His mother was taking control we've talked about this mother before 13 on, the, on an episode of the podcast oh yeah we talk about the mama mm -hmm. yes i forget but i heard of a nine-year-old king tina it's it's in her brain somewhere carolyn's got a guess not a bad guess carolyn you're close very close keep going <laughs> louis for sure i mean they're all louis right Claudine told us she loves the Louis, so. I do like it because, you know, a lot of them picked the name Louis because of Louis the Ninth, because of Saint Louis, because he was so loved and revered in, in history, that that's why a lot of them picked that name. If you're just tuning in, we are talking about the kings and emperors of France, and we're asking you some fun trivia questions. So who was named king at only nine years old, but they wouldn't give him control until he was 17? And Cheryl and Phyllis are correct. It was Louis the Thirteenth. It was Louis the Thirteenth. So his father, Henry the Fourth, that we just talked about a couple of questions ago, 
he was killed on May 1610, the day after uh, his wife, uh, Marie de Medicis, was crowned at Basilique Saint Denis. And he was going through the streets near uh, Leal, and right where Leal is now. And he, a uh, religious zealot, jumped onto his coach and stabbed him to death. And so Louis the Thirteenth was only he was, uh, he was too, too young. He was over he was over where there was that where on a uh, Rue de uh, Rue de Grand Grands Augustins, which is where Picasso had his studio. And they went over there and found him and brought him back to the palace. And but he was too young, so Marie de Medicis had to serve as regent, and then that's when she loved it because then she could really have some power. Okay. And uh, so when he was old enough, um, she wouldn't let him take over. She, she stayed with it. And it wasn't until he actually uh, um, launched a coup and basically had her forced out um, that he was able to actually take over the reign. It's like, come on, mom. Can yeah. I be the king yet? Yeah, they, didn't have, they didn't have a very close relationship, that mother and son. <laughs> I, know, I feel like that was a pattern in all the kings and mothers. There was a lot of weird things happening. <laughs> <laughs> there was some of them, you know, Louis the Fourteenth and his mom Anne of Austria. They were, they were pretty close. Mm. They didn't have any weird? Well, as not. Yeah, a lot of the moms weren't very motherly. No. All right, guys. Good guesses. Next question: A lover of the Renaissance, this king transformed the court and the monarchy. So this king, he loved the Renaissance, and then he decided to transform the French. Court and monarchy. Any ideas on who that was? Well, we know it was a king. We know it was after or during the Renaissance because he liked the Renaissance. And he transformed the court and the monarchy. If you're like me, you have no idea. <laughs> History lesson. <gasps> I'm learning. You know, it's so funny because when I was in public school, I remember very vividly in high school, they were like understaffed. It didn't have, you know, enough people. So literally we had our um, our high school sports teacher teaching our history class as well. The gym. Oh, wow. So that's maybe why I struggle a little bit with this. <laughs> I don't really remember much about any European history. I mean, other than, you know, I American school. I mean, most people don't even know that there was, you know, multiple Napoleons. They just think of True. Napoleon part or, you know, they're, um, it's very condensed down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did learn way more about American history than we did European. I think we learned a little bit about World War One and Two, but we didn't go like deep into French history or anything. Yeah. Like that. that would have been pretty interesting though. I wish we would have done that. <laughs> Carrie. Uh, just going, Louis, I like it. Louis, it's very smart. Only that, she'll always be about 80% correct if you if you stick with a Louis. <laughs> throw a Louis in there and you might, you know, you're probably close to the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> Phyllis, you try. I like these guesses, guys. It was actually Francois Premier. Yes, it was his uh his mother's mother. She um loved the, everything the Italian Renaissance. So she raised uh from his sister and you know teaching them any everything about the Italian Renaissance and about art and culture and everything so when he ended up becoming a uh, king he was living at the um at the palais and at the time it was very medieval he's the one who basically started to do the grand day which was what changed it closer into what we see it and know of it today but he uh, time uh, you know court was much different when he got there he held um salons and they had big parties which his sister organized quite a bit and so he it basically turned it into the the court of france that we know of you know louis the 14th and stuff like that that all started with francois mm. francois changed france in many ways not easy yeah. to do and he, you know, he was the one he brought, you know, Leonardo da Vinci came to France and he, you know, gave, bought, he bought some of his paintings and was given some of his paintings. And so it was a collection of Francois that basically started the Louvre. Oh, that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. Carrie's like, can we do Midnight in Paris? I guess Carrie knows more Midnight in Paris information. She's doing good. She's doing mm -hmm. great. She's keep throwing those Louis in there. <laughs> All right, guys, next question. This emperor had the crumbling Notre Dame transformed for his event. So there's your first clue. It was a emperor 
and Notre Dame was literally falling down and he mm -hmm. transformed it into something much nicer for his special event. Yeah. And there was two emperors. There was only two emperors, guys. And they yeah. sound a lot alike. <laughs> yes. Who do we think it was? <laughs> Midnight in Paris. I need to rewatch that. I haven't watched that in like Oh, so good. So great. I'm not a big Woody Allen fan, but I do like that movie. I'm not either, but I love that movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's done really well. Maybe because he's not in it. True. That saved them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right carolyn says napoleon the first not a bad guess does anyone else have a guess carolyn knows her history guys napoleon the first first coronation good job cheryl cheryl knows her history too ladies you are correct phyllis is correct too it was napoleon bonaparte it was napoleon and he uh he um, was coronated on December 2nd, 1804, coming up, uh, the anniversary comes this week. I will have, I think I have four or five posts that I've already written for Instagram with uh, tons of details about it. Um, but he actually, most of, the, most of the kings of France were always um, coronated in Reims, the Notre Dame de Reims in the Champagne region. But he wanted to always keep himself, he never want, he didn't want to tie himself to any of the kings. He was, you know, he was Napoleon. He wasn't going to tie himself to anything else. So at the time, Notre Dame was in horrible shape, very, very bad shape, falling, you know, like the walls were crumbling, everything was really bad. So he actually had them transform it. They cover, they built features um, almost for people to sit in. They walls they did all of these things he he was given he gave notre dame all these different gifts like the crown of thorns and some other things to kind of uh fancy it up and it's all very well documented in that wonderful amazing painting by jacques louis david which you could see where they covered it you can't go you know you can't take that painting and go into notre dame and be like okay where was it because <laughs> you know, again it is a painting it's not a it's not a photograph but he uh he was the one who basically and then be and after that it was also partly it's part of the reason why they were it kind of gave the renewed interest in notre dame not just victor hugo but also with napoleon he brought attention to the church mm -hmm. Knock it down. All right, guys. Good guesses. We had 50-50 chance on that one. Yeah. <laughs> a little more complicated, but I did learn this on my visit to Versailles. This was interesting to me. Next question. If you're just tuning in, we're talking about the kings and emperors of France, and we love hearing from you. So throw out your best guesses. Next question. This king enjoyed spending time with his clocks more than his wife. So I learned about this in Versailles on a little tour, and I was like, wow, interesting. There was a lot of rumors about him being gay, too, but I think he was just weird, right? Yes. Well, there was another one that was most likely gay. Another Louis. Another Louis. Oh, she gave away half the answer, guys. <laughs> Louis was interested in his clocks than his wife. <laughs> yes, Carrie, he did have to paint his mom. Uh, David uh, painted his mom in, in kind of the center. I was thinking, I have a big print of it somewhere. Um, in kind of the center in the upper part, because she did not like Josephine, and she disagreed strongly with their marriage, and so she wasn't there, so David painted her in. You didn't dream it. You know that. <laughs> good. We got some good guesses coming in. Yeah, I th and she's very prominent in the painting as well. Yeah. Like she's very obviously there. It's a gorgeous painting. It is really pretty. It's in the Louvre, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very large. Very very large. Second largest painting in the Louvre. Oh wow! All right, we got some good guessers. Carolyn is correct, Carrie is correct, and Cheryl is correct. It was Louis the 16th. It was, and uh, you know, we, we I think our very first live stream was about Marie Antoinette, wasn't it? Wasn't that the very yeah, first one we did? I think it was, yeah, I think it was. Um, uh, Louis the 16th, uh, you know, their, their issues in the bedroom was uh, very well documented and he um, would rather spend time playing with locks, taking them apart and putting them back together. Uh, and and uh, that's what he wanted to do more than spend time with his wife. And then once Marie's uh, mother sent her brother to court to visit and had a little chat with him, that's when uh, things started to pick up a little. But, you know, I think Louis was just a poor, sweet guy that, you know, 
didn't really want to have the trappings of court life and just wanted to hang out with the animals and play with locks. <laughs> Poor Louis. It wasn't his fault. He was just a young boy at heart who just wanted to play with clocks while Marie was uh, having her fun. If anyone's yes, seen the movie of Marie Antoinette, great movie. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, Carolyn, there is a version. Yeah, there is a bit, there is a copy of the David Sacre de Not uh, Napoleon at uh, Versailles. All right, ladies and gentlemen, good guesses. Next question. Let's see if you can get this one. In the midst of adding on to the Palais de Louvre, he up and left. So he was adding on to the Palais de Louvre, doing some, you know, construction, some home decorating, you know, little trip to Home Depot. <laughs> and then he just took off he just left who was that guys any idea who was remodeling the palais de louvre and then just left it didn't finish the job maybe he ran out of funds maybe there was a revolution you know so many things could be happening in france turbulent times guys turbulent carolyn says louis the 13th not a bad guess. Very close. Was anybody else taking off and running in the middle of adding on to the Louvre? Any ideas, guys? The Louvre has seen so much history. If those walls could talk. I love it. We'll have to do about 12 live streams about it. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Live from the Louvre. They're supposed to be opening the museums again, I think, in January if the numbers stay down. Yeah, I write that mid-December for the for the museums. Yeah, the museums are mid-December. We don't get to go to the gym again until January. And restaurants not until January 20th. Yeah, yeah. But I'm excited about the idea of museums opening. So yes. I have a yearly membership to the Musée de Montmartre, and I cannot go currently. I wonder if they're going to extend it since I wasn't allowed to go. I, that's what they said that they were doing after the first lockdown for the Louvre and all of those. But um, I still got a letter in July saying I needed to pay up. So they didn't. It There was no it should have gone. It should have been extended like three months and it wasn't. They changed their mind. Yeah. I'm wondering the same thing about my gym because I'm not allowed to go. So they better pause it. All right. And actually, Carrie is correct. It was Louis the 14th. See, there you go, Carrie. Yes, it was Louis the Fourteenth. Um, it, it's each uh, king lived in the Louvre. They like to add their own personal touch and leave their own little mark on it. And Louis the Fourteenth was doing quite a bit of it. He actually had built um, the Apollo, what we know as the Apollo Gallery. Um, he had built uh, the the uh, the floor right below the Gallery de Palon is was um, Anne of Austria's summer apartments. Her winter apartments were there. Too. He was actually doing a lot of work on it. He started to have the colonnade um, built at the, which is on the very eastern side of the palace and uh, on, the, on the silly wing. He just said 1674, he didn't anymore. So he up and left to Versailles and left the colonnade unfinished with it basically the, the ceiling completely open for quite a, quite a long time. It wasn't finished and it wasn't completely finished until un, under Napoleon. That's crazy. He just left the roof open. Yeah, he just, what well, he was like, I'm out of here and <laughs> took off for Versailles. I mean, upgrade, we've all seen Versailles. Love it. Yes, <laughs> yes. And he did a lot of that work on, I mean, that was, Versailles is all about him. Before that, it was just a small little hunting lodge. The middle, the middle part of the front courtyard when you walk in, it was just that little part, and that was it. He got bored. Yes. <laughs> all right, guys. Good guesses. Next question. This guy created a museum dedicated to the history of France at Versailles. So there's a museum inside of Versailles dedicated to the history of france which king or emperor did that any ideas does it still exist can we still visit this little museum no sadly Ooh. some of the some of the pieces the art and pieces from it are still there as well as other as other um, in other museums around but the museum itself is not do we know why it was dismantled uh it was it ended up being um it never really got fully finished mm. And then it was um, abandoned in 1832. Oh, so much Everybody that knows exactly the years that the kings were there, what years they were, now they get figured out. <laughs> oh, that, Claudine. <laughs> 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 All 
Not a bad guess, Carolyn. She said Napoleon III. This guy created a museum dedicated to the history of France at Versailles, which no longer exists, sadly. That would be interesting, though. I'm curious if, like, yeah. you know, a lot of countries, they change the history to kind of make themselves look great. So like you wonder how much of the history was really <laughs> <true>. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie's back with a Louis. <laughs> it was it the Louis who came after the revolution, the 18th? Not a bad guess. Partially correct. You got half of it again. You got a, it's Louis. <laughs> Heidi, not a bad guess. We love it. The actual correct answer was Louis Philippe. Yeah, Louis Philippe. Uh, after after the fall of Louis the Sixteenth, none of them really wanted to live out at Versailles anymore, and so Louis the for Louis Philippe, sorry, he actually decided he wanted to create a museum to the glories of France, and so he had uh, he had it started, and then but it only about twelve years into it, it ended up being abandoned and not finished, and uh, but you could still see today with when you go to Versailles, the building that you go to enter where you go in with your ticket. If you look up on at, at the top, it says, A toute les glories de France. So <laughs> it, wa it was in that building at one point. A lot of the art, like I said, a lot of the art still remains. There's um, a kind of a whole other part of Versailles it's on the it's on the tour when you go in, um, but I think the first time I went there, I don't think I think it was closed. But there's a huge room that's basically all these humongous grand paintings of the different battles, mm -hmm. and then there's busts of different generals and everybody else, and there's these beautiful, amazing paintings. So there's quite a bit of it that's still in Versailles, but the museum itself is not. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Versailles is so fun. Carrie, I'm right there with you. It's confusing. <laughs> All right, ladies, we are good guessers. Let's keep going. This guy built the first wall around Paris. Any ideas about who built the first wall around Paris? It's either a king or an emperor who built the first wall around Paris, which there's still remnants of it in the city. I think especially in the Marais, you can see mm -hmm. some original walls, correct? Yes, there's a very huge part of it still in the Marais. Yeah. Um, Louis Charlemagne. I think it's so cool that there's, they found, um, I mean, it's been around for a while, uh, a Roman uh, theater. Yes. In Paris. You can, and now it's just a park and nobody mm -hmm. really goes there except for locals because I think it's in like one of the, the Arendis malls that no one really goes to. Yeah, it's in the Latin corner. Victor Hugo was behind uh, helping save that too. Oh, really? Victor Hugo? Mm -hmm. They yeah. found it when they were digging for the metro. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I went. I did a family photo shoot there. That's the only reason I know it exists. Oh. So like, wow, why is there a Roman amphitheater? It's kind of a morbid place to get <laughs> to a baby. <laughs> Where we murdered animals and people. Let's do family pictures. Oh, Don, <laughs> Don's here. Don, you've been shy this whole time. You're just tuning in. Clovis, not a bad guess. Cheryl, Philippe Augustus. Augustus. There is a part of it remaining on Rue Clovis. Uh, I love the part that's in the schoolyard, part of the wall of the schoolyard. I don't know about yeah, that. That's the uh, on the Rue Charlemagne. It's behind the Saint Paul Saint Louis Church. Oh, the very cool! I need to go visit that. So, guys, we have a lot of great guesses. It was actually Philippe Augustus Augustus Auguste Philippe Auguste. I'm pronouncing the S's. I should know better. He had it. Um, he had it built in 1190. He had it started before he left on a crusade. He thought maybe he needed to protect uh, the city, so he had this wall wall built. Um, I'm knowing today how long it takes in Paris for them to do uh, to renovate a building. I I can't believe he just thought, hey, I think I need to build a wall, and let's just do it. <laughs> So it was built at even, uh, it even uh, st went around the loop. And so it was kind of in right there. But over time, there's been multiple walls that have been uh, wrapped around it. So it just kept getting kept getting bigger and bigger. Uh, but there is quite a few pieces of it still left that you can still see. There's a really cool piece up on Rue Clovis, Clovis that's um, up uh, right behind. If you kind of keep going past St. Etienne du Mont, it's right there. There's also a piece in a parking lot that I love mm -hmm. to take people and show them on Rue Mazarin. 
Um, I love to take people down there and show them the uh, the piece of the wall that's there. So there is kind of quite a few pieces around, which is pretty cool to go see. Really cool. I mean, it's so old. No Thanks. One from the 12th century. No big deal. All right, guys. Next question. This king was known as the loved. Who was the beloved king of the loved king? I mean, I feel like there's always so much drama between power and the people in France. I don't think there's ever been a president these people liked in France. <laughs> so I can't imagine what the kings, any of them being loved. This is a while ago. This king was known as the loved. The loved. Anybody have a guess? I can tell you half of it. Carrie always knows half of it. <laughs> yeah, not a bad guess. You got half of it. Switch up those Roman numerals, though. Italy. You're almost there. The loved king. Why was he loved, Claudine? He was just, he was the, well, I don't want, I might give too much away. He was kind of, let's say he was sandwiched in the middle of two more controversial ones. So everybody hated the other guys. They're like, this guy's okay. Oh, Carrie got it. Louis the 15th. It was, yeah. Louis the 15th we is known as Louis the Loved. Um, but there is actually quite a few of them that actually have names like that. There was Pep in the Short. Um, I think a lot of them were more uh, more because of how they looked. Um, another one, Charles the Second, the Bald. There was Louis the Second, the Stammerer. Poor uh, Charles, Charles the Fat. Charles, Charles the Third, the Simple. I think that might be the worst one. <laughs> oh no! Louis the Tenth, the um, hot haughty, like hoi polloi, I guess. Louis the Thirteenth was the just. Louis the Fourteenth was the great, and Louis the Fifteenth was the loved. And that was the last one that had a spec. Louis the Sixteenth, and none of the other guys got anything special after that. <laughs> I love the simple poor the guy. Simple. I know, poor guy. <laughs> it so well for him. Good <laughs> guesses, guys. All right, keep them coming. We love hearing from you. Next question: Who had the shortest reign as King of France? So this king had the shortest time span of reigning over France. What happened to him, Claudine? Well, I can't. I can't give that away yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they won't know. It was very, 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 very short period of time. Did he get like uh, smallpox or something? Black no. <laughs> All right. So this guy was the king of France, but he was the shortest man to reign over france the shortest king the shortest not up in the short but shortest amount of time <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, that could be confusing like he's a short man pep in the short was married to last this last week's podcast mm, yeah. i didn't know that or bert as you like to call her i call her bert <laughs> <laughs> louis the short good guess don it was actually louis the 19th Louis. Yeah, so, and, and as you know, you know, you're saying who who was Louis then? There was no Louis the 19th. So Louis Anton, who was the 19th, he was actually the husband of Marie Therese, who was the only surviving child of Marie Antoinette. He was king for 15 to 20 minutes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> he was the son of Charles the 10th who abdicated because of the July Revolution. And so there was a period of time in there that he was actually king of france for 15 to 20 minutes and then he abdicated um in favor of louis philippe who was his cousin mm, he's like i don't want this job here you go cuz yeah there was another there was also uh, another one uh henry it would have been he would have been henry v he was um the nephew he was he could have also been another short short timer contender but i don't really think that they actually put him in there as a name but the poor guys i guess they didn't live you know i guess it's like the four second rule they just didn't <laughs> nope <laughs> not even enough to be really in the history books wow yeah i never heard of a 19th that's probably mm -hmm. why a whole 20 minutes yes that was a tough one guys you learned something new and now you have something to but share look here got it louis antoine this is true carrie's a genius good job carrie. We love you, Carrie. All right, guys, next question. We're getting towards the end. We love your guesses. His three sons would rule in succession for 30 years before the power shifted to the Bourbons. Bourbons. 
Did I say it right? Bourbon. <laughs> Don't pronounce the S's. <laughs> so his three sons would rule in succession for 30 years before the power shifted to the Bourbon. Who do we think that was, guys? Which king or emperor, his kids were in charge 30 years, and then all of a sudden, the Bourbon were in charge. Mm -hmm. I can give you a hint. Their mother, their mother was a witchy woman. She was a witchy woman. Was she the one involved with uh, baby blood? Nope. <laughs> Women. That's coming up later this month on the podcast, though. We're going to put a parental warning at the start. Yeah, of that. I need to put a PG-13 on that podcast because mm -hmm. uh, that one was graphic. And we try, uh, to, we try to make it as the least amount of graphic, but still get the point across. <laughs> Tune in. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Tina said a witch with a bee. Uh, she, yeah, she was definitely that too. She was a witch and a bee witch. I mean, she was all the witches. So this guy's three sons ruled in succession for 30 years before the power shifted to the Bourbons. The answer is Henry II. Yes, yeah, so Henry II died on July 10th, 1559 after a jousting um, accident. A piece of the lan uh, lance got actually into his eye. He got sepsis and ended up dying. At the time, his uh, his children were all um, younger. And so Francis II, his son, um, took over first. He was the one that was married to Mary, Queen of Scots. He um, reigned for 16 months, for a little just over 16 months and died. Then Charles IX took over, his younger brother, um, from 1560 to 1574, he was uh, quite young at the time. So Catherine de Medicis uh, served as regent. Um, and then after he died, Henry III took over from 1574 to 1589. And he served the longest. He did not have any children. Um, he is, uh, by many historians, was believed to be gay. He was married. Um, he ended up being actually murdered later on. But he was the end of the line of the Valois. And so that's why she married her daughter, Marguerite, off to Henry III of Navarre, who became Henry IV, King of France. Wow. Just to make it more confusing. I was going to say, wow. Well, Roman numerals in the middle of it. <laughs> diagram. Can you put that in a chart somewhere? Exactly. Like, exactly. That's a lot to remember. You guys can remember all that. You're as smart as Claudine. <laughs> all right, guys. Good guesses. Next question. This emperor transformed Paris. And Carrie asked, was he the last of the Navars? Um... The Navarre, no, because he was kind of the start. Mm, he was the start of the war. And then there was the Bourbons. I know, Dawn, it gets confusing. Yeah, we need to watch a a little video about that. The houses. I'll get, I'll get a big, huge dry erase board, and then we could have yeah, some. Yeah, we need to sketch out the <laughs> French history. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. So much incest and killing and cousins. Yeah. And Illegitimate children. and Yeah, all that fun stuff. Cheryl, you are correct. It was one of the Napoleons. Which one? Which Napoleon transformed Paris? Janet says Napoleon the third. Phyllis says Napoleon the third. Carrie says Napoleon the second. These are all very good guesses, guys, but the correct answer is actually Cheryl and Janet and Phyllis have it correct. It's Napoleon the third. Yes, of course, Napoleon III, with he and uh, his buddy, Baron Hausman, who went through and decided uh, they wanted to fix the water system, but it was also because of sanitation. It was pretty, it was pretty bad, bad, excuse me, and the traffic was starting to get bad. They wanted to open up these huge, grand, uh, into grand boulevards and have them have these vistas that, you know, like now today you see you know, uh, Rousseau, which goes up to the Pantheon and the, you know, the opera. So they basically wanted to also create this ama amazing landscape of Paris. At the time, of course, it was quite controversial because they were basically decimating whole neighborhoods and deplete, you know, people were losing their homes and everything like that. So of course it was, uh, as most things are controversial at the time, 
But, you know, if it wasn't for Napoleon III, and I don't think uh, Paris would look like the Paris that we love today, unfortunately. He just came in and was like, all right, you're homeless now. Make it Paris. Yep. There. Bye. Yep. Like, We're taking your place, take, t tearing it down. Did they get their home back after? Like, where'd these people go? I don't know. I think they just kicked them out of, you know, because I mean, there were whole neighborhoods, you know, streets and, you know, the Medici fountain in the Jardin de Luxembourg was moved um, because it was farther out into actually what is Rue de Medicis now, the street itself. And so that was luckily some of those things were saved and they moved them. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of things that uh, that weren't saved. Yeah, I'm curious what happened to those poor people that lost their homes. But the house, you know, the houseman buildings and the with the beautiful, you know, you know, the beautiful balconies and everything like that. It's you know what makes Paris Paris now. It's true. Wouldn't look the same. No, it wouldn't. All right, guys, we're coming down to the last three questions. So this guy believed the sun rose and set with him. It's very much a Versailles reference. Mm -hmm. This guy was a little full of himself. I would say not a little. I would say very full of himself. <laughs> he was actually probably an egomaniac, maybe a sociopath. Am I pushing the limit too far? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they, they were known. I don't think sociopaths were known back then. <laughs> yeah. There wasn't a label. I mean, we just got serial killers not that long ago. I mean. Definitely egomaniac. Egomaniac. Mm -hmm. This guy, the sun is rising and setting with him. He had a lot to do with Versailles. Who was it? I think we all know this one. Good guesses. Don, Heidi, Cheryl, Janet, Phyllis. It was Louis the Fourteenth. The Probably the most known king of France. Yes. I mean, I think if uh, if anybody had to name a king of France, I think Louis the Fourteenth is the is the one that most people have heard of. It's in in time uh, but he called himself the sun king when he was a child he actually dressed up for it as a in a ballet as the sun king um there's some really great sketches of it online um, i think it was louis i think it was louis vuitton they actually had in their store at place vendome they had a model wearing he had this huge head that was the sun king that's the same emblem that he always uses um, but he decided he wanted to take on that image for himself. It was also attached to pa Apollo, the Greek god of the sun. And so he kind of took that on. But he situated his bedroom at Versailles. So it always faced um, looking at so when the sun rose up in the morning. And if you go to Versailles, like I've gone first thing in the morning on a beautiful day and uh, been there when the sun is rising and the sun literally like directly hits that statue of him on the horse in front of Versailles. Yeah, Versailles is a magical mm -hmm. place. I love it. Gorgeous. I agree with Janet. Versailles is my favorite place on earth. Heidi, we're so happy you're having fun. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. I don't retain history either, but I do enjoy the moment. And that's <laughs> like history tours over, over and over again. I listen to my podcast over and over again. <laughs> Remember, <thank you. laughs> All right, guys, these are the last two questions. This emperor wanted to align himself with other great emperors. So which one of these guys wanted to align himself with other great emperors? This emperor wanted to align himself. How many emperors were there? There weren't that many. Only two. So he's like, I want to align myself with the other guy, basically, because there's only one. I kind of alluded guy. to this one a little bit earlier, as I said. That. We talked about this. Heidi's dog, Louise. Oh, so cute. I can't believe, Don, you've never saw yet. What you must go. Um, you got to get over to Versailles. Great place. Very important place to visit. All Gorgeous. right. You guys are correct. It was Napoleon Bonaparte, Napoleon the first. Yes. yes. Yeah, as I mentioned about uh, he didn't want to be crowned at uh, Notre Dame de Reims. He wanted to be crowned at uh, um, uh, Notre Dame de Paris and on December 2nd, 1804. And he ended up having his regalia um, basically tied back to Charlemagne. He had his crown was called the crown of Charlemagne, where it had the actual. Um, oh, my gosh, what are they called? They were like little medallions. uh what do you call them when it's like the uh, side of your side of your face profile, like profile medallions? Profile. Um, 
He also had this Soros Char Charlemagne create built created, um, which is I saw at uh, Fontainebleau and the um, Napoleon Museum, which is just like it has. It's they're not. I don't think they're the real ones anymore. But they had diamonds on them that were like this big. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, so he had all of that. I will have that on my Instagram in the next couple of days, a whole thing about the regalia. But he wanted to align himself with Caesar, with Charlemagne, with these great, you know, holy Roman emperors, because he, you know, of course, didn't want to align himself with any of the kings or the mm -hmm. Bourbons or anything like that in France. He wanted to, you know, go a little deeper to really cement, you know, who he was. Another egomaniac. Yes, definitely. He and he and Louis would have a, I don't know, if you put him into a contest, I think Napoleon would maybe be a little worse. <laughs> a little worse. No. I love them both, though. <laughs> a little bit more. Yeah. All right, guys, this is uh, the last question. So everyone give your best answer. Are you ready? This guy was known as the Ver Gallon for his way with the ladies the very gallant claudine can you translate that for us the very gallant well there's a part in the uh we could say on one of the islands in paris it's called uh the very gallant mm -hmm. and it's basically it just means that you know he's uh he's very he's very good with the ladies he's a gentleman he's a gentleman if you can call him that. So this was this was a king or an emperor. He was known for his ways with the ladies. Also, I'm pretty sure he got murdered in his carriage. <laughs> Am I getting my kings mixed up? <laughs> you guys, give me your guesses. Very good guesses. And I posted on my Instagram stories one of my favorite paintings of him that's in the Louvre. And he's wearing what looks like silky shorts. And then his legs, like he has one leg kind of out. And then he's got this kind of smirky face look on his face. But his legs are like amazing. <laughs> and he's like crushing like a serpent or a dragon or something like that. But it's one of my, I love that painting. It's really cute. He's like, you know, you want it, ladies. Yes. The legs. You guys are all geniuses. It was Henry the Fourth. Yes, Henry the Fourth. You know, first he married uh, Marguerite de France, the daughter of uh, Catherine de Medici. And when they didn't have any children, and that didn't work out so well, he ended up marrying uh, Marie de Medici, which is that they did have children together, but probably wasn't a very fantastic uh, relationship. His real love was Gabrielle Destries. Um, she was he actually. To marry her, she ended up dying in childbirth um, before they were. Uh, he hopefully marry her because his first marriage annulled, and uh, she is actually the subject of a very another fair, very famous painting that's usually hung right next to Henrina's legs. It is a painting of uh, two men and this two sisters believed to be Gabrielle, and the one sister is pinching part of her anatomy, pitching her nipple, which was said at the time to be a sign of pregnancy. Interesting. Um, but he was, uh, he, that was basically his true love of his life. When she died, he was devastated, but he, he had quite a few late into his later year. He, uh, he definitely was a, had a way with the ladies. And if you see that painting of him and his legs, you kind of could see it too. <laughs> yeah, I see it too. Well, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. We love chatting with you. We do this every two weeks. Claudine, do you know what we're doing for the next one? I think the next one, in honor of the season, we should do one about Notre Dame de Paris. I think so too. Christmas is coming up. The holidays are coming up. We could give you all the fun facts and trivia about Notre Dame. And if you don't know about it already, we run a weekly podcast called La Vie Creative. And every Monday, I chat with Claudine, Paris history advocate Kay Hemingway, and we talk about a different woman in French history that maybe didn't get the credit she deserves. So tune in every week. Just simply Google La Vie Creative Podcast. You can find us on iTunes, on Spotify, Apple, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. You can find La Vie Creative Podcast, and we love teaching you guys and learning with you. And Claudine is a genius. You can book her for tours in Paris once travel is open. And we both have Patreon pages if you are interested in more fun Paris things. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> the episode tomorrow is about uh, Juliette Recamier, who you will know from a very another very famous painting in the Louvre um, by Jacques Louis David, where she's laying um, down on what ends up being called a recamie, um, kind of a chaise lounge type of a thing. Um, she uh, she was a pretty fascinating character, so she's going to be the episode tomorrow. Oh, yes. Tune in, guys. When you wake up in the morning, the podcast will be live. La Vie Creative. And Carrie, thank you so much. We love chatting oh, with you guys. Carrie. I was just chatting with her this morning. Carrie's the best. We love Carrie. And Heidi, oh, and thank you for next us. Sunday. Tell them about next Sunday. Oh, what's happening next Sunday? <laughs> the Walmart. Oh, my goodness. How could I have forgotten? So we are doing a Facebook Live as well where we are going to take a live video walk around Walmart at sunset. Claudine is gonna be chatting with me live as I hold the camera, walk around Walmart live with you guys, giving you a little history tour on video. You can definitely sign up for that. We will put the link in this uh, live stream and we would love to see you there. We're gonna give you history about Walmart, the artists that live here, and you'll get to see the Paris sunset in live time chatting with us. So if you'd like more information about that, simply send me a message and you guys have a great rest of your week. Wonderful, have a wonderful end of November. <laughs> see you guys in December, bye. <laughs>